Welcome back to In The Midst. Um, I am sorry it's taken so long for me to come back. Things have just been crazy, which I'm sure all of you guys completely understand. But today, as I was reading in my devotions, I was just reading through Colossians chapter one, and the whole chapter really just seemed to come alive. And it was just so clear, applicable, encouraging, all those things, and I just knew okay, I have to share this. This isn't, this is for me, but it's not just for me. So today that's my desire is to be an encouragement with you to go through this chapter. So I'm going to reference a few verses um, in particular, just so you can kind of know where I'm at, but it's, it is going through the verses, but I'm, I didn't copy like exactly what the verse has said and which verse has which thought. It's just kind of all encompassing, but at the same time it is individual. So I hope that makes sense and it's not too hard to follow. Um, so there's just so much in here. It's so encouraging. This chapter gives us both instruction and encouragement, which is what we need God's word for. Um, so we're going to start with the introduction. Paul wrote this book, this letter to the Colossian church. Um, this is something that Paul did a lot. He wrote to the Thessalonians and Ephesians and all of that. We know that. We know who Paul is. Most of us are very familiar with him, his life, his ministry, all of that. And there's always a pattern at the beginning of his letters. He introduces himself as either a servant of Christ or an apostle of Christ. This is who Paul is or was. This is how he saw himself. This is how he wanted you to think about him. This is how he wanted to be known. This was his identity. So think of what that word means, identity. People on the radio, on the news all the time, it's we're in an, in an identity crisis. What does that mean? So often we are searching for who am I? What's my purpose? Paul knew. Paul had that. His identity, his purpose was found in Christ. And that is where you and I have to find our identity. That is where we have to find our purpose. It's in Christ. If you are saved, if you are a Christian, you belong to him. You're a child of God. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and look through um, that chapter, all of our riches in Christ. And Paul goes along with that. Okay. Paul goes along with that here to continue this thought of how we're to walk, how we're to live, what our lives should be like. And we should be very careful to guard our testimony. It's, I don't want you to just get hung up on, oh, what do others think about me? Stop doing that, please. On what do others think about me? Because there is a point that that doesn't matter. It's what God thinks about us. But our testimony is how others see us. And what they should be seeing is Christ in us. Our lives should model, should reflect Christ. When they read the Bible, when they learn of who Christ is, when they think of how does Christ love me, they should they should see that in us. So Paul knows who he is. It's found in Christ. Paul was a missionary. He was a preacher. He was a teacher. He did all of these things. He was a soul winner. But that's not what he's saying his identity is. Those are things that he does because of his identity in Christ. And it should be the same for us. We have gifts, we have talents, we have burdens. Um, many of us are parents. So we could say, I'm a parent, I'm a sibling, I'm a friend, I'm an employee, I'm a child. Um, all of those things are true, but our identity in Christ has to come first. You are a Christian, you are a child of God. And everything else, how you parent, how the kind of spouse that you are, how you treat others, how you approach the your job and your ministry and all these things have to be based on Christ. You know, we, can you stop doing that? We say your foundation has to be Christ. Your marriage has to be built on Christ. Your home has to be built on Christ. What does that mean? Who I am in Christ dictates how I parent, how I handle my marriage. If you're not in Christ, you, that's the very first step is coming to him as your Lord and Savior. Second of all is walking with him daily. What does that mean? That means being in the word, 
reading the scripture, well, God, what do you want from me? What do you expect of me? How am I supposed to be different than the world? How am I supposed to be different than how I was when I was lost? That is what his word teaches us. And we pray. So having that prayer time, coming to God, seeking answers, asking for wisdom, advice, um, guidance, direction, conviction, all those things come from him. And that's how he answers is through prayer, the leading of the Holy Spirit, through conviction, and through the word of God, through the Bible. So those are the two things that we must be doing every single day. So Paul was all these things, yet the only thing he highlights is being an apostle and being a servant of Christ. So what did that do for him? What did that change for him? Well, Paul was a man of prayer. He was a man of praise and thankfulness and thanksgiving to God because he loved or and he loved people. And all this is because of finding his identity in Christ. So he often told how he was praying for the church that he was writing to. He's praying for the saints. He talks about how, did you do the back of that page? He talks about how we, he was talking about how he gives thanks for them, for their faith, for their encouragement in the ministry, for their service, how they love other people. He was thankful for what others were doing, not just what God was doing for him, but he was thankful that they were following Christ. Is that how we feel about people? Are we excited to bring them to Christ, to be that soul winner, to see them abounding in the work of the Lord? Or are we just going, ah, whatever, it's not a big deal, do what you want. Um, understand we can't force anyone to salvation. We can't force anyone um, into Christian service, but we should be encouraging them. We should be going to them and saying, I thank God for you. I thank God for your service, for your example, for the way you teach that Sunday school class, for the way you disciple people, for the way you love people, for being so friendly. We should be encouraging one another in those things. Paul did that. He desired for these Christians to walk as God would have them to walk for their benefit. Are you concerned about other people and their walk with Christ? Again, we can't force and dictate this, but we can encourage them. We can say, hey, you know, you reading your devotions? You, you in your Bible? Your prayer life okay? Are you okay spiritually? Do you need anything? You struggling with something? Is there something I can pray with you about? Paul loved God. And because Paul loved God, Paul loved people. Too often, people are a distraction. We don't like people. We don't want to get dirty. We don't want to get caught up in drama. We don't want to be committed to being an accountability partner. We just don't want to give that time. We want to serve the Lord, but I don't want to deal with that. You guys, we can't separate the two. God's ministry is people. You and I are God's ministry. You know, God saved us. And that's something that we have to remember. Because if it wouldn't have been for somebody loving us, for somebody loving God, you and I would not have heard the gospel. And we would not be saved on our way to heaven and experiencing the love and blessings of Christ. So remember how you got saved. The gospel has to go forward. Um, so Paul didn't want anyone to live in bondage to sin. He didn't want them to live outside of God's will. He wanted them to be set apart. He was concerned about their spiritual condition. Why? For their benefit. Living in sin does not bring the blessings of God. Paul didn't want to say, I started this church and I encourage them and they're doing good because of me. God said, no, I want you to walk worthy. I want you to walk with Christ so you can experience these spiritual blessings. So you can know God as I know him. That's what God, that's what Paul wanted was for them to be known of God, and they were, they were saved, and for them to know God intimately, closely as he did. Walking in sin, living in disobedience, living in opposition to God does not bring the blessings of God. It just doesn't. So you are hindering God's working in your life. You are hindering your fellowship with him, and you are hindering your spiritual growth if you are not walking in accordance to scripture. Are we perfect? No, not at all. Are we saved under grace? Yes, absolutely. But we are still called to be set apart. Don't use grace as an excuse to sin. Paul was very, very clear about that in another writing. So he cared about their spiritual condition. Do we care about ours? Do you care about only yours? We can care and should care about the spiritual condition of other people. 
whether they need that encouragement. They need us to pray with them. They need us to fast for them, with them. Um, this is something that we should be concerned about. God is concerned about it. Paul was concerned about it. Paul knew living in sin was not beneficial to them. That's why he encouraged them not to do it. Do you want your friends to know Christ more? Do you want to know him more? When someone comes to you and says, you know, I, I really don't want to step on your toes or be pushy, but I see maybe what you post online. Maybe it's you know, that you're having that glass of wine every night and they're saying, you know, I just want to make sure you're okay. Maybe it's, you know, your retail therapy and they're like, you know, I just want to make sure you're okay. You know, I, I don't want to see you running to alcohol or Target every time you're upset. You know, I, can I can I show you how to come to Christ? Can I give you a verse? Can I help you pray? And we're like, no, I'm fine. You can't tell me what to do. We're allowed to drink, blah, blah, blah. They are concerned about your physical and spiritual condition. They are trying to help you. If we are, re if we are refusing that, <clears throat> we are not helping ourselves. Part of being a Christian is not only helping and encouraging, but being able to take that help and encouragement, that correction. We need it. That's what the Word of God is for. That's what your pastor is for. That's what he's surrounded you with other Christians for, people that love you and want the best for you. You have to learn to accept that, not let your pride get in the way, and then go, Satan made me do it. No, he didn't. Stop giving him more credit than he's already due, okay? <laughs> you are responsible for your actions. Remember that. If you want your friends to know Christ more, if you want them to experience God more, walk closer with him, grow spiritually, but you see a sin problem they're having, they're always arguing with their spouse, they don't take any advice, whatever it is, and you're not going to them saying, I love you. I do. It just kind of looks like you're struggling. And can I help you? Can I pray with you? Can I give you a verse? And you're not giving them that. You're not helping. We can be all for giving the gospel. People aren't going to come to Christ unless they're saved. You know, unless they hear the gospel. That's how they get saved. And that's true. But they're not going to grow if they're not getting the word. There is absolutely nothing wrong with you sending someone a Bible verse on text and saying, thinking about you, praying for you today, just wanted to send you this, thought it might help you. But we don't want to step on their toes. Paul wasn't like that. Christ isn't like that. Send that verse, send that text, offer that hand of encouragement. Whatever it is that God's leading you to do, do it. Someone else needs that, but when someone else does it to you, remember to take it. Um, verse 10, he talks about walking worthy. And Paul, we hear this in a couple different places in scripture, but walking worthy, why? Because it leads to blessing. Um, Paul points out here that walking worthy leads to being fruitful in every good work. I don't know about you, but I don't want my efforts, my work, my time, energy, and resources to be spent on something that's not going to be productive, fruitful, useful. I don't want to just waste time and energy. Um, walking worthy being in line with God's word, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, walking and living how God wants you to live. That way we are spending our time and thoughts and energy and money and resource and all that on what God wants us to because we're following his leading and it's yielding fruit. It's yielding results, godly, eternal results. I hope you desire this in your life. I hope you're not just spinning your wheels, being idle and nothing's happening. God wants to show you more of himself. He does. He wants to show you great and mighty things that you know not. But if we're living in disobedience, then that can't happen. You know, even Christ, when he went to um, all the different towns doing miracles and teaching, things were being done. People were coming to him. People were being saved. People were being healed. But in Jerusalem, he could do not many mighty works because of their unbelief. So when they were rejecting the Savior, he said, my hands are kind of tied. I can't. He's not going to force himself on you. He's not. You have to be willing to let him lead. Walking worthy leads to being strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. I sure want his strength and power on my life. I don't want to do this without him. I'm going to mess it up. It's not going to be fruitful. People aren't going to see other people uh, or other people aren't going to see Christ in me. I don't want other people to see Heather. I want people to see Christ. I want people to say, it's because of the Lord or look at what God's doing in her life. Look what she trusted God with and look what he did. Look at that answer to prayer 
because she trusted him. That should be our goal. I don't want to do this life without him. Next, it leads to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Patience, long suffering, and joy are all fruit of the Spirit. This comes when the Holy Spirit works in your heart and life. When we live in obedience to him, one day at a time, following that leading, asking God for wisdom, for leading, for guidance. He generates this in us. He grows this in us slowly over time. We can't generate this in and of ourselves. And if we do, it's very surface level. One thing comes and goes wrong, there goes our joy. There goes our patience. There goes our long suffering. And we can't sustain that without Christ. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Next, we see that Paul desired these things to be found in the life of Christians for our benefit, not his. Do you desire to be closer to God? Then there's going to be sacrifices that have to be made. I'm going to have to read my Bible. I'm going to have to pray. I'm going to have to go to church. I'm going to have to take that correction from someone else rather than sleeping in on Sunday and watching the game and, you know, watching TV instead of reading and praying and all that stuff. Paul praises God for making us accepted, Ephesians chapter 1, accepted and acceptable partakers of the inheritance of the saints. We have so many blessings, so much of a godly, eternal inheritance. When's the last time you thanked God for that? For saving you so that you could be joint heirs with Christ, so that you could be accepted in the beloved, so that you are free from sin, that you now have an eternal godly inheritance that you are an heir to. We take these for granted or even worse, we don't even realize what God's given us. We don't realize what he's done. So take time today to thank him for his goodness. God is the one that delivered us from the power and darkness and power of darkness, sorry, and translated us into the kingdom of Christ. This is not something you earn. This is not something you inherit because granddaddy was a preacher. Mom is a Sunday school teacher. So I'm a Christian. I'm going to be okay. That's not how it works. It's by faith in Christ alone. And it is all him. He has delivered us from that power. He has translated us into the kingdom of Christ. He has blessed us with that inheritance. In Christ alone, we have redemption through his blood. We have forgiveness of sin. Take time to read about the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. We talk about the fruit of the spirit. We have the works of the flesh. The work of the flesh is something you and I are 100% capable of doing. When we lived in sin, when we lived in bondage, when we lived before salvation, even after salvation, we still battle our flesh, the power of sin, you think of all the works of Satan and all that he does, the worst, most vile, dirty, terrible, hateful, mean act. You and I are capable of that. But for the grace of God, there go I. That's what Paul said. We are not above sin. We are free from sin. We don't have to give in to its bondage. But at any time, you and I can step off the path of righteousness and onto the path of sin. And be doing all those things that we did before. All those things we see the lost, the world doing. We could be right there with them. So thank God that you're not there. See the things that you're capable of and thank God for saving you out of that life. He has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. He's chosen to forget them. The God that created everything knows you and I more than anyone else. The hairs of our head are numbered. He knows our past, present, and future. But praise God when we ask for forgiveness. He's chosen to cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. To cast it in the sea of his forgetfulness. He's chosen not to remember. He didn't have to. He could hang that over our head and say, you've done it again. You asked for forgiveness for this. You promised me you would stop. And you did it again. But he doesn't. As long as we repent and ask him for forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. That's the power of God. He is the creator, the sustainer of all, including you and I. Our very lives are in his hands. He is to be preeminent in our life, which means to have first place. And it's pleased God for Christ to be in this position. God didn't just say, I guess, if you can handle it. No, that's his plan. So we should be pleased with having him on the throne of our lives as well. That's God's plan. In Christ alone, we have reconciliation. This is how we are able to come to God. Verse 23 begins with if. It is a choice to 
to be grounded and settled in our faith. It is a choice to not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Verses 26 and 27, I believe these verses reveal that God makes things known to them that are faithful to him. Like I said before, if you're living in opposition to God and to his will, this will not give you spiritual wisdom and understanding, insight. God is not going to show you those great and mighty things because you're not even obeying the simple things. His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. If you're holding a lantern, you can't see more than three or four feet in front of you. That's all you need. You take that next step. You take that next step. And then God continues to reveal that path. He reveals more understanding and wisdom. Um, some people know God deeper than others. I've experienced things somebody else might not. And there's been other people, saints, that have been doing this for 40, 50 years that have experienced things, that have experienced God in ways that I can't even comprehend. Why is that? Is that God's favoritism? No, it's their faithfulness. When we are faithful to God, this is when he gets to work and show us things. So seek to walk in accordance to the scriptures. Let God reveal who he is. This is what he wants. He wants to be known and he wants to know us. He knows us. He does. But he wants that close, intimate fellowship relationship with us. Seek to know who he is. Let him into your heart. Let him have those spaces that it's hard. The sacrifices, the things that you don't want to give up. Nothing is too big for God. Nothing is too big of a sacrifice to God. Anything you give up, it's going to be worth it. Ten times over because I've never seen the righteous forsaken. That's who God is. He wants to be with us. So, I hope this was a hope or a help and an encouragement to you. Trust him, walk with him, let him lead and guide you. So until next time, stay in the word, stay close to the shepherd and let him lead you in paths of righteousness.